You're watching Quick Word for You. Welcome back to another edition of Quick Word for You. We are so glad you're with us again. Good to see you for another week with Quick Word. We um, appreciate you spending this time with us. Uh, the Word of God, the Bible says, is quick, which means it's living, it's active, and it accomplishes. It'll do what nobody else, nothing else, no program, no formula can do. It's the, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and we need that today. How many of you know right now when there's such a, a, a secreted move in government or such a secreted move in false doctrine that we need something to cut through and, and, and tell us what the thoughts and intents of our heart are? Because that's what's going to open it up so that we can address it and say, Lord, forgive me. We can't get where we need to go without the word of the Lord. Amen. And that word of the Lord that it talks about in Hebrews that says the word of the Lord is quick and powerful. It's talking about the word spoken, amen, from a man or woman of God under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And when that happens, it's going to do something for you. So we appreciate you tuning in today. It means a lot to us. Let me have you do this as well. <clears throat> Go to www.wotcministries.com. There you can see our full ministry. We have uh, things you can see, archived messages of both quick word for you and don't forget our sunday program which is really i've been a blessing to a lot of people which is cross country where we have guests that come special guests every sunday and we talk about issues in the body of christ that and in that large in the world and we address it from what the cross of christ says and we're even getting questions on our live chat so you owe it to yourself at seven o'clock p.m on sunday nights to go do us another favor. Hit like, subscribe, and share. Yes, we need you to do it. We still want to make sure we're ahead of the algorithms. The, the devil can't stop what God's trying to do. And if we all do our parts as a community, there's no way we can stop this from getting seen. We don't want to put our light under a bushel. But we want it to be seen. So do your part. Just simply hit like, subscribe, and share. And we want to hear from you. Leave a comment or two. I've seen some of your comments and they are a blessing to us. And thank you and keep doing it. We're going to pray and we're going to go into God's word. And we want to talk about humility and ultimately talk about humility and repentance. What's the difference and what's the point of it? And what does it really mean to be humble? And what is the opposite of humility? We're going to talk about that today. So you definitely want to stay tuned. So, Father, we come to you right now. By the authority in the name of Jesus, Lord, and we thank you for who you are and what you have done. No one else could have done it but you. Lord, you are God in the flesh. Lord Jesus, you are the one and only supreme, the way, truth, and the life. And you are the one who made a way when there was no way. Outside of you, there was nothing. Lord, and we place adoration to you and thanksgiving to you because you're the only one. And Lord, we thank you. We love you because of it. Bless us today. Speak to us. Lord, we decrease. Let you increase and give us a word so that we can go on another hour, moment, year, week, whatever. In your name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to get into our word. We're going to make it quick. <laughs> amen. We're going to get into the word. and We're going to go to uh, Peter 4, 1 Peter. Sorry about that. 4 verses 5 and 6. And, you know, there's a misconception. I love blowing up misconceptions. There's misconceptions in the world about what it means to be humble. Um, I, I know back in the day anyway, preachers were considered, we needed all of our preachers to be humble, and we do. Every man of God, woman of God, whether they're a preacher or not, we need to walk in a spirit and stage of humility. But one way we judged that, whether you were humble or not, was what kind of car he drove. If he drove a beat up beater, as we call it, with, oh, he's humble. Or if his Bible had a bunch of holes in it and, you know, he looked like he really was struggling, then that meant he's, he's humble. No, that means he's broke. <laughs> Has nothing to do with humility. 
Um, and then the other side of it was, let's say he drove a Mercedes. And, you know, and don't let me preclude this with this. We don't need our preachers having three jets and four Mercedes Benz. I'm not preaching nothing like that. But if a man of God has a Mercedes, a Jaguar, whatever, does not mean that he's in pride. No. What humility and pride is all about is what way you're going. It has to do with the way. It actually has to do with righteousness. Because remember, the righteous path or the righteous way is the path of humility. And when we jump and decide to go God's way, you have now chosen humility. Okay. Remember the word of God says, if my people will humble themselves and pray, first of all, you have to choose which direction you're going to go. And that choice in God's way and his path is called humble. Amen. That means you are being humble. The other side of it is if you decide to go your way and there's a lot of pride, pride undetected, sad to say, in the body of Christ. I know I know sinners have pride. I know I, we know that they're supposed to. That's like animal dogs are going to bark and smell like a dog. If they don't, I'm more confused. <laughs> but when Christians don't have humility, then that's where the word of God needs to be elevated. That's where the word of the Lord needs to get in there. Amen. And we see a lot of Christians with pride, a lot of us, because we don't understand what pride is. We think pride is uh, driving that better car or getting education. Oh, he's just puffed up in education. Maybe, but maybe not. Pride, you could basically be driving a beater, as we call it, and be straight pride. You say, how could that be? I'll tell you why. Because if God may be wanting you to have something different, he may be telling you, "Get go my direction. And you choose out of his way to go your way because it makes you feel this false sense of humility, this false, which is pride, <laughs> this false sense of righteousness. And you're straight in yourself now. You know, it's the same with any scenario. God may be telling you as a minister of the gospel, to um to to tell it like it is, preach sin, sin, call homosexuality a sin, but because you choose to go your way instead of his way, you are now being um pride. That's pride because you're setting yourself up as the authority when it was God. He said, "Go my way." That would be humility. So, and these are good principles to understand because. We need to, the Bible says, he that is spiritual judges or discerns all things. How can we discern and judge what we're doing on a day to day basis if we have no litmus test? But we do. Amen. When you're faced with a decision, a choice, which way do I go? You need to ask yourself, is this my way or God's way? It has nothing to do with the, the monetary value associated with it. How many people are going to see you? It has nothing to do with that. In fact, God may want to elevate you and you choose to be abased. And he's telling you because the message you carry needs to be elevated. Ooh, I have to, that's for somebody. And let me tell you, if you go your direction to be false, humble, you're basically walking in pride and you're going your way instead of the way he's telling you to go. So it has nothing to do with how many people are looking at me, how much money, how fancy it has nothing to do with humility and pride. Humility and pride is strictly a function of which direction you're going. Are you consulting your way or are you consulting what God's way is? Amen. So let's read. If we go to first Peter um, five and five, it says, likewise, the younger submit yourselves unto the elder. Okay, and it says, yes, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Okay, so he's making humility a, a garment. Okay, so humility, like I was saying, we as believers are supposed to walk in a state of which way is this? When you're faced with, with, with situations and choices, 
our choice making decision is paramount to the believer because you can wind up by going your way and not actually discerning, taking a few moments to check your spirit and say, Holy Ghost, which way is your way versus my way? Then you'll find yourself shipwrecked in a matter of days, weeks, months, and years. And it all started back from when you went your way versus God's way. So he's saying you need to clothe yourself in humility. This needs to be something that's on us. Amen. You should be able to see it when I look at you. I should be able to see, oh, he looks humble. They should be able to smell it coming from you. Christians should, should walk with an aroma of humility that's detected, that they're not consulting their what they want, but rather what God wants. Remember when Jesus said in the garden, nevertheless, not my will, oh my God, but thy will be done. That's the ultimate act of humility. Verse six, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And I really wanted to focus on that because he's using the word humble and exalting in the same context. If humility was about being abased, then why would it tell you you're going to be exalted? Yes, it's in due time. But if God wants us to be always abased, then then humility could not be taking the lowly road. Let's just stay down low because I got to be humble. That is not humility. Amen. That's that that's could be pride. Now, where we want to go with this ultimately is for the sake of repenting. Remember where it says, if my people will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, then I'll heal from heaven and heal their land. You can't even repent unless you humble yourself first. And thus, one of the big problems in the body of Christ right now, and notice I call it the body of Christ, the church or whatever, we don't got to split hairs on what it is. but When John the Baptist, in fact, let's go there. Let's go to Matthew 3 and 2. Matthew 3 and 2. You got to realize Jesus just came on the scene, okay? And, or at least he's there. John the Baptist knows he's there. And he says he's coming. He's the one. He's the man. Amen. And so the point was the word repent in the original Greek means a change in mind. I know a lot of times we take repentance to its um, to its full state of where it ends up. It ends up in turning away from sin. Amen. Good preaching. Totally a fact. That's the goal. God wants us to turn from our wicked ways. But, you know, you cannot turn from your wicked ways unless you first choose the right way, which is righteousness. And then number two, you must change your thinking. Repentance is a change in one's thinking. In the Greek, it actually means a change in mind. The actions always follow. And this is consistent with the message of the cross that Paul taught. Because we teach and Paul preach, you know, if we believe right, the actions are always followed. And if you think right, you're going to believe right. So therefore, God wants to fix us at the root cause of it all. That's one thing I love about the gospel, the pure gospel versus man's attempt to fix us. You know, AA and NA chooses to fix man from the outside in. Psychological counseling tries to tell you that man's problem is from his community and his environment. And therefore, let's alter that to fix the inside. Let's do it from the outside in. But, you know, this is this message of the gospel. This message of the cross goes to the beginning of it all, even to the word of God, going to the thoughts and intents of the heart, because there lies man's problem is in his heart. And unless we first make a decision that I'm going the path of righteousness, amen, thank God for the preacher. Because without the preacher under the unction and the power of the Holy Spirit, man won't have that confrontation in his heart that says something's wrong with the way I'm going. And, you know, it's even harder to have this message with people that already know Jesus Christ or have heard of him, that have already walked with him. Because what happens, we get these false ways. 
You know, we get the 40 days of uh, purpose. We get the, the Jabez prayers. We get this grace revolution. We get this, all these different movements that are in the church. And we're so um, in our way that is not God's way that we won't even listen to what the men of God are saying that, hey, come out from this, come out from this. And this is really where John the Baptist is. He was amongst people at that time, which would have been the people of God. These were the people of, of, of Abraham, of his descendants. These were the people that was in the synagogues every every Saturday. And he's telling them to repent, turn, change your thinking. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, the man is here, he's came. And you know, that's the message of the gospel of the cross. The message of the gospel of the cross is telling you he's came. Your sanctification, not just your justification, is not in this other stuff. It's in what he did. Amen. So we need to repent. First, we have to humble ourselves and admit that we missed it. You got to admit that I went the wrong way. You know, my family, all of us that are at least at the cross, there was a point in time where we had to mark a point at this point. I could tell you when it happened. I remember when my brother was bringing it to me, there was a monumental decision. That was where the humility came. It pierced in my heart because of the messaging that was given. And I said, I got to change directions. Something's wrong. But was I, you was a Christian. Well, yes, I love the Lord. Spoke in his tongue, went to church, saved and led many people to the, to the Lord. But when I found out that I was not appropriating sanctification, the right way. And and there was some sanctifying power there, but it wasn't nearly to the degree it should be because I had the wrong system. I was doing it the way that was out, but the way that's out isn't the way that's in here. Amen. And once that's illuminated, you have to humble yourself to say something's wrong with the way I'm going. Then you've got to change your mind how do you change your mind? Repentance will always lead to behavioral change, but it starts, the germination of it starts when you say, I repent, I'm changing. I'm going from this way to this way. Amen. I'm going to go from this set of thoughts to this thought process that I've been given and it obviously doesn't work. I'm going to go to this new thought process, which was always not new. It's been in the word from since the beginning. It's the message of the gospel that Paul preached. Hey, man, this saying, if we go back to the basics, see, repentance is always to go back. It's never to go into new. Beware of things that are new. It's always to go back to the old paths. Hallelujah. But it says, let's read this, and then we're going to close this, and we're going to pick it back up tomorrow. Matthew 3 and 2, he says, and saying, well, let's go to 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent you for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. That's the message to turn to change. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you know what? The message of the kingdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified is at hand, not just for your justification, but you know what? It's also there for your sanctification. It was always there. Let's turn. Amen. Didn't say you weren't justified. Didn't say you weren't saved, but you can, you need the sanctifying experience. And if you don't, you know, there's danger to not repent when the Holy Spirit is telling you to. So let's pray right now. We're going to ask God to forgive us. Let's start right now. Father, say this after me. Say, Father, I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for leading me to repent because I've missed the mark. Some in ignorance, some by choice. But I ask you to forgive me. Lead me. I change my thoughts to your thoughts of the cross and how you fixed it all exclusively without need of anything else. I denounce psychology. I denounce false doctrines. I denounce false ways. And I hold to you 
In Jesus' name, amen. And let's continue all this week to just lay down all of our ways, amen. And let's just begin to draw closer and closer to God. That's the message of this hour. It really is. It's not about how much money we can give. It's not about how good your shout is, even though all that's important. It's about how much Jesus we can fall in love with. And he who's forgiven of much loveth much. Love you. Thanks for joining us. A quick word. We'll see you again tomorrow. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Quick Word for You. Don't forget to share, subscribe, and hit the like button. And feel free to comment. Please visit our website at wotcministries.com. We'd love to hear from you.